Welcome to Alex and Annie, the real women of vacation rentals. I'm Alex. And I'm Annie. And we are joined today with Steve Schwab, who is the CEO and founder of Casago and my new boss. <laughs> Steve, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. We're, We're so, so excited, excited to, to have you. Yeah. Alex mentioned to you that when we first put the podcast together, we had our like target list of people that we wanted to interview. And I had you on the list, um, worked at our, our company when I was at Lexicon had worked with Casago. And so I was really familiar with what you guys had on the surface, but really wasn't understanding really what it was all about. So it's nice to come full circle and have Alex working for you and then have you on the podcast. Um, I think a lot of people know who you are, but I would love to hear who is Steve? How did Casago come to be? And, and you start us off from there. Sure. Yeah. Well, and and uh, I guess in, in that story that you just told, told um, Alex didn't have any idea who I was, which is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> How so, much has changed in a year? <laughs> right. Right. I love that. That's actually the best part of that whole story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm been in the industry for about 21 years now, coming up on 22. Uh, started as a kid just out of um, the army in college and went down to Mexico, uh, kind of on a last minute thing and decided to live there for a little bit. And uh, through a series of events, um, which being I was at a, at a bar and uh, this really huge man, like six foot seven, was talking about how you couldn't crawl up on a roof. Uh, and I had actually done some air conditioning and metal work in uh, high school my senior year. Until I can do that. So I followed him out to this beachfront community and jumped up on the roof and grabbed a grabbed an electric drill and some uh, and some metal screws and started fixing the problem. He offered me some money. I was like, no, I could tell something was wrong with him. You tell you it didn't feel well. And so uh next day he came and found me again and I did a little more work and I told him he couldn't pay me, but I'd I'd uh, I'd take a beer in exchange. We became friends and he had me over for dinner at his house and his wife owned Cindy's beach home rentals. And, uh, after a while I hadn't seen him and he come to find out what was wrong with him. He had cancer. And he passed away. And, uh, his wife called me up, said, uh, I think you'd be pretty good at this. And Bruce specifically talked about you and said, oh, Cindy, I'm really not a maintenance man. I just did a little <laughs> bit of work for you guys, for, for, but you know, I'm not a maintenance guy. And she goes, no, no dummy. Uh, <laughs> actually owning this business, he thinks that you have, you know, the right uh, idea for running a business like this. And so through a series of looking at uh, all the paperwork she had, there was no software. Uh, I ended up uh, buying the company from her uh, on a little bit of borrowed money and, and uh, a little bit of a prayer and, and off we went. And that's how I got into the business. That was 21 years ago. And uh, I still have uh, about half of those employees left in Cindy's Beach Rentals. One passed away, uh, one's retired, and the other housekeeper, uh, we have now three generations of her family working for us. So wow. it's pretty cool. It, yeah. It, it's incredible. Great, and we we hear from so many of our guests how they kind of fell into vacation rentals and they didn't ever really plan on being in this industry. And, and many of us, before we got into it, didn't even realize that it was an industry. But when you first started, I mean, did you, did you 21 years ago, did you know anything about vacation rentals or that it even existed as a business? I, I knew it existed. It was on my periphery. It wasn't anything that I could have ever done at that time uh, or afforded. Uh, I'd seen it, um, knew nothing about it. They kind of had explained how the whole thing worked to me, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, from there out, uh, it was. I didn't think that there was a lot of people like us out there. I felt very alone. Uh, I felt like uh, we were sort of the uh, uh, the redheaded stepchild of the hospitality industry. When people from the hospitality industry would say, "What do you do?" Oh, I'm a I'm a vacation rental property manager. They'd be like, "Oh." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, Sorry. It was actually, yeah. Yeah. It felt kind of, it, it didn't feel great at the time. Uh, it's funny how the industries come from sort of the, uh, all, you know, the alternative sort of side thing to becoming this, you know, multi billion dollar business and recognized as a mainstream of uh, travel now. Yeah. It's been yeah. fascinating to watch. Yeah. 
Red so carpets been, and all. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I've been in in vacation rentals since the late nineties in the market that I'm in. So Panama City Beach. And and I I remember that because the company that I worked for was hotels and we were morphing over into vacation rentals. So I kind of ride, you know, rode the fence for a number of years, but you would go to meetings and well, which what are you representing here? Oh, these condominiums that are being built or these vacation rentals. And we were like, you people are causing so much problem. Like it's just, it was just, it was just this, they didn't know what to do with us. And so it is funny, you know, to your point, like just to see how it's come, you know, it it seems like lightning speed that we've all of a sudden become this, this industry that people respect and, and look at and, and really um, know that we're not going away and that we're not alternative. Like I always joke about it. Like, I don't know that I like being called alternative because I think we are an accommodation choice and it just depends on what people are doing. Um, But over the time that you've seen the industry evolve, um, you, a lot of your business was, you started in Mexico, correct? So that's where you you started out. Um, And I think that for me, living in a market that just sort of blew up overnight, I mean, I think yours was a pretty slow, methodical growth. Was that how Mexico was growing at the time or was it just your involvement and it was slow? Well, the town of Puerto Penasco, I happened to catch the wave just as it was, as it was starting to build a uh, condo resorts down there. And uh, my competitor, which was Rocky Point Management, um, they were sort of the 800 pound gorilla in town. And they left in the middle of the night with everybody's money. Uh, it was actually on the t- it was on the day that uh, Saddam Hussein was captured, and oh, wow. uh, yeah, we I saw their 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 vehicle barreling, like just going crazy, driving like recklessly towards the border. And uh, how strange! And I got to the office and realized they had uh, left with all the homeowners' money, with all the payroll, um, with everything, and. Through that process of taking care of those homeowners, uh, word got out, and uh, from there on, we grew. We were we grew throughout the entire beach, and we became the the favorite. Uh, became the hometown boy of 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 the vacation rental industry in that city, and I was pretty happy with that. I never planned on that much growth. Um, it was actually a lot of learning. Um, I'd never operated anything to that size or ever planned on it. Um, so I sort of stayed in that, in that, that area in that, in that sandbox for a long time, trying to figure out how to run the business. And then when we, um, when we decided that we were probably, uh, had too much of the inventory there, we decided to go to uh, San Carlos. And so I, I opened up a San Carlos and thought I could just rubber stamp what I'd done in Rocky point. And mm-hmm. Um, that was a punch to the face. Uh, it was a lot of learning. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't, you know, when you when you go to these cities, you can only be a local in one place, and yeah. there's a local I love culture of homeowners. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there, there's there's a local every every city has its own local culture when it comes to homeowners, and there's very different expectations of what the commission should be, who pays yeah. for what, how things work, and uh, you know, you dance their dance, they don't dance yours. Right. And so you, you've got to go in and understand and be sensitive to each community. And, uh, that was my first lesson in, um, uh, being humble and, and loving the community instead of thinking the community is supposed to love me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that was foundational to our ability to grow the way we have throughout the years after that. And how did you grow in that market? Like once you got in there and realized that it was different than what you were used to, like what, what were the steps that you took to make some progress? You know, getting somebody local uh, Mm -hmm. come in and help Um, understanding that I have to do it their way. They're not going to do it my way. Mm -hmm. Um, That my success in another city or community has no value in this community. Um, You know, my, Whatever I've done well in another community has a zero value to the new place I go. Uh, we have to show up. We have to be humble. We have to be local. We have to love on the community and not use the community. Um, and understand that you know the system and pro- processes uh, and commission rates and fees have uh, you throw those all out the window and start from scratch again. 
and rebuild to that community. Um, there's only a few things that are always immutable and, you know, uh, transparency, trust, ethics, being uh, centered on your homeowners, making sure that they're well taken care of, uh, loving on your guests so they have an amazing uh, experience and come back. Um, these are the sort of immutable principles, right? But everything else, um, start over each time and, mm -hmm. uh, and be humble when you hear uh, what that community wants and needs. And don't try to tell them what is best for them. You know. We'll be back in just a minute after word from our premier brand sponsor, Casago. Well, we're a family-owned company, uh, family-run. Only family works in it, and you know we're kind of a boutique, as people have said. I'm not sure what boutique means, but that's what we are. When I started this business, helping one lady out who did all of the work herself and just wanted me to look after her property and make sure that the housekeeper got it clean, I thought I was the only person doing this because it was vacation rental by owner. And I wasn't an owner. So who was I? I was helping a lady out. I had no idea that this was a business, none whatsoever. And it organically grew to where it is now. That's Michael Godfrey, owner, operator of Sun Valley, Idaho, Casago franchise. Michael started the business in 2012, growing organically by building relationships and trust within his high-end resort community. I'm a ski instructor. My son's a ski instructor. My daughter's a ski instructor. And that makes you an ambassador right off the bat of Sun Valley. We get tourists in, we get people in that, that look at our lives and just say, oh, if I could ever live a life like this. And we appreciate that. And we know how blessed we are to live this life. And then to have something like this business, which gets... Its number one goal is to bring people here and show them how we live and let them experience it also. We asked Michael if he had ever imagined that he would be part of a vacation rental franchise. I had no idea there was even such a thing. I went down there and met with, uh, you know, Costco at their office and, uh, you know, it was pretty impressive. And I started to realize how we could uh, really piggyback on there and, and bring in their uh the resources that they have into our company without giving up our brand, without giving up anything, really, just adding to it, just an, a, and not even costing us any more money because we're already paying uh, percentages out to our various purveyors of the, uh, uh, you know, different channel masters and, and uh, revenue managers and, and uh, property management software and stuff. And so it's really not a cost. And in many ways, I believe it's going to simplify what we do by putting everything more in one basket and having it so spread out. So Costco offers such a, a large suite of, of um, services that I look at as employees, as having depth. So by going with Costco, I become a much bigger company with no great, uh, with, with no additional uh, expenses. Mm. You know, no overhead. I mean, I don't consider that overhead. And yet I've got the, the um, you know, backing of a large, you know, successful business. And, uh, you know, they're doing it. They're doing it right. And we've done things right. I was so surprised at my first conference to find out that all the stuff I just naturally kind of did is kind of an industry standard. So, um by going with them, I just think we can, uh, you know, grow bigger without adding employees and, uh, and having, you know, the depth and knowledge of these guys that really do it well. I've mentioned before, I said, you never know you got in on the ground floor or something until you're on the 10th floor and you're looking back. So I think it's just, uh, I've met the people there. They're personable. They run their business like we do. It's all about relationship and, you know, they know stuff. I know stuff. We work together, and but they're uh, you know they've got the resources to um, to help out when I've got questions. To hear more stories from franchisees like Michael and learn about Casa Go's vacation rental franchise model, visit casago.com forward slash franchise. So was you that the jumping off point for you to start this as a franchise or were you managing for several years 
and then decided that I could replicate a basic framework to operate, but then we needed that local person, the local flavor to really make it successful? Um, a, a big part of the growth in Mexico was um, I, I'd read an article that was called Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship and essentially it's this article about this, um, this young guy in an ink company who had this great ideas about all these new colors and, and what the market wanted and needed. And the old guys basically told him no. And so he left the company and uh, started his own ink company and nearly took the old company out. They ended up having to buy him and make him a partner instead of just taking his idea and going with it. And I was watching uh, my, a lot of my team become very mature. Uh, they were worth having their own company. And if I wasn't going to be a part of it, they were going to do it one way or another. Uh, and they deserve to. So taking some of our best people and um, helping them grow their own companies mm -hmm. and giving them equity. And instead of being their boss, becoming a peer and a partner with them uh, was my initial uh, foray into growth. And these were people who understood the values of hospitality and ethics and what the values uh, that we've instilled, you know, which are the non-negotiables of what Costco is. And then the principles that we use to honor those values, which were, you know, the rules around what it takes to to uphold, you know, what our non-negotiables are. And they were ready to be their own people. And so uh, making uh, an opportunity available for somebody who started off at $100 a week in Mexico as a front desk clerk to becoming my business partner and peer with their own ownership in Costco was the first was the first step to that. And then uh, as we came into the United States, um, I ended up with an office in Scottsdale. And through uh, kind of a, a happen chance with, uh, uh, with two guys at a, uh, at a conference uh, where Eric Brion had uh, pretty much told all the local and small uh, vacation rental companies that they should just give up, that they'll never be able to compete with Vacasa. Uh, we had a talk about how this uh, shared resources could turn into something fantastic for everybody. And they both signed up. And uh, that was the beginning of the franchise model. So there wasn't really any plan. It's been, uh, um, it's been purely by trying to do the right things over time and seeing when uh, uh, people deserve to have success and, and enabling them and uh, growing them, uh, speaking into them and, and, and mm -hmm. facilitating their, their ability to be successful. Yeah, I love that. I, I read a great line yesterday that you don't go into an opportunity, you grow into an opportunity. And I believe that's so true. And, and certainly something that Annie and I have seen in, in this past year with the podcast and our own careers and just, you know, looking at Costco's evolution and now not only hearing the story that I've heard, you know, this, this is a baseline, this is only a, you know, 50 minute podcast, but getting to hear the true behind the scenes of what took it took over those 22 years you know, it's looking back, it seems like it probably all happened fast, but there's a lot that went into every single year of that process, right? And it's, you know, it's interesting to think about the companies that have had a challenge with growing, that they've just tried to just buy another company in another market, that if they've been in a beach market, they've said, let's let's diversify, let's get a mountain company or, or something out west. And in most cases, it doesn't really go very well. Um, and I think the model that you took whether you intended to do that originally or not that's that is definitely the foundation of the success that we've had because when you have the local operators that they have skin in the game and accountability and they they are, want to uphold the, for the community and also for the organization that that's that's the pathway to success so it's it's a great model and I'm just excited to be part of it, to be honest. But <laughs> I'm excited for you to be part of it. You're the <laughs> key to this, to the future success of this. Um, you know, it's how are you going to find somebody who really loves a community uh, as an employee from another state? Yeah. Um, 
you know, that back to that, you can only be a local one place. Find somebody who really loves a community and understands, you know, the, understands the expectations and is accountable to their neighbors. Mm-hmm. Um, this is still a local uh, business. And, you know, people talk a lot about scale and efficiencies, but you can't put scale and efficiency to knowing who you can call at two in the morning or who you went to high school with, who's now has a maintenance company and will pick up the phone for you at mm-hmm. three in the morning because you've got a flood going, you know, who's going to turn that wrench, um, who's going to be there and who's going to own that relationship locally, you know, it's that business owner. It's not a forty thousand, fifty thousand, eighty thousand uh, uh, dollar hired suit. It's somebody who's like, man, I got to get up. This is how I feed my family. I own this business, and they're going to go up and, and turn wrenches in the middle of the night or or uh, fix a, a, a cleaning issue um, because something went wrong with the you know uh, it, with the coordination of it. That's that's what this business is really about. It's about like loving on those homeowners enough to take care of their property when it's inconvenient and and being obsessed with building the best guest experience you can possibly make so that the owner is better served and wins more by those guests who love the property coming back over and over again. Yeah. You you told a story the other day that I think is so telling of that about a homeowner in Rocky Point and uh, something that happened, a, a car accident. Can you share that with us again? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've been on this uh, kind of mental journey about uh, what love letters are to homeowners and homeowners to us. And uh, we have uh, this homeowner that's been with us for 21 years now, since the very beginning, um, Canadian lady and her husband. Um, you know, anytime you see them, uh, they'll sit down and, and, and talk with you for an hour. Um, really lovely people. Uh, they've been with us so long that the, the resort that they own at uh, didn't have internet uh, when they bought. So they come to our office and use the <laughs> yeah. internet uh, on our computers and there was no Wi-Fi. So <laughs> right. they're like, like, hey. We got to uh, do reservations. Like just one more minute, you know. And uh, all these people. <laughs> so and so, funny. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> the, the um, yeah, I'd get questions like, "Steve, we got to pay overtime so we can get our work done because uh, uh, the computers are being used." Like, yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> love on them, just love on them. Right. And, uh, That's too funny. And and so uh, yeah, sure enough, they end up in a in a in a fender bender. Um, and uh, they have neighbors in town that they you know, obviously trust. They have uh, family in town, uh, a couple of actually which speak Spanish. And um, when you're in a wreck in a foreign country and you have the police there and communication is not going well, uh, I think it's an unusual idea to go ahead and call your vacation rental property manager. Uh, because you're in a fender better with the police, but that's exactly what she <laughs> did. And it was a love letter to Casago uh, by calling us. Like, yeah, the relationship had been built on a principle that had uh, transcended business. Yeah. She knew we actually yeah. cared about her as an individual. We, we, um, uh, we were, we wanted her to be well. It wasn't just a matter of like, hey. We're going to rent your property. We're going to clean it. We're going to fix any problems. We'll, we'll pay for damages. We'll collect from guests. Uh, we'll make sure that you're fumigated, well inspected, and, and that all the lights turn on. Um, it goes beyond that. It was like we care about her, and she knew it. And as soon as she called, uh, we had five people there. She was surrounded by Casio uniforms, mm-hmm. translating, uh, um, negotiating, uh, calling local connections of who we knew, and uh, it worked out really well. Uh, and that was our love letter back to her that we care about you, um, that this isn't transactional and you're not on your own when you're outside of this, that if you call us for anything, uh, we have a relationship with you. We don't have a relationship with your property. It's not a relationship with your property. It's a relationship with you and we care about you. And, you know, and, and Sally, she's had some, we've made some mistakes or she's had questions about, you know, like what's on the statement. 
or, you know, why'd you charge this rate or, you know, what's going on with this cleaning or what's going on with this, you know, work order. But she never calls to fire us. She calls to work on the relationship and have questions about, you know, what's, you know, about the account. And that's also a love letter, right? Because if you build those deep relationships and, you know, it's not how often you, you talk to them is how much you care about them when you do talk to them and yeah. as them as a human being. And um, when they call to fix the problem, even if they're frustrated with you, they're doing that because they have a relationship with you and they trust you. Not because you're just something that can be undercut or undervalued. You, you can't charge less commission for more trust. Um, oh, it's not so a commodity. Yeah. 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 And, I think- and so, yeah, love letters to homeowners and love letters from homeowners is, yeah. uh, and even, and guest is, is the name of this. We're not in a, we're not in a business of just uh, logistics. This is um, a business, a relationship with yeah. our homeowners, our guests, our team and the community. Mm-hmm. And we just happen to do vacation rentals as the yeah. way to pay for it all. Yeah. But it's a four way relationship and we're in the business of relationships. We think about it like when's the last time you got in a car wreck and you called your dentist, right? Or yeah. you know, <laughs> you're not gonna call <laughs> you, another yeah. you just don't do that. I mean, and it's yeah. kind of unusual to call your vacational manager, but when you think about it, it actually is it's less unusual because and I'm sure our listeners can relate to this. I mean, they the companies that understand this business know exactly what you just said. It is a relationship business. It's about trust. It's about uh, empathy. And if for that homeowner to call you, it's like you guys, you're her people. So that, right. that's 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 everything. It goes back to yeah. that saying of um, you know people forget what you do for them, but they never forget how you make them feel. And I think that there's a lot of people that have come into this business in the last, you know, I'll say 18, 24 months um, from a dollars and cents standpoint, thinking they're going to make money. And Alex and I talk about this a lot of times, the get rich quick guys, women, gals, whatever you want to say, um, and and don't understand that, that, you know, this is a very big business. But it's a very small industry in terms of the number of people. And we're all interconnected and we all have relationships with each other. And there is that trust that is so important that I don't think that you get at the same level in other industries, certainly not in the hotel side of the business. I think it's that's just more of a it's black and white business. Let's, you know, the heads and beds, let's get the dollars. And vacation rentals has so much more tug at the heartstrings. It's a it's a it's it's a feeling. I mean, this our industry is actually an emotion. And that's that's the way I look at it. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's, uh, you know, people, uh, are concerned about how do they feel about what you do? I mean, yeah. you can do everything right. And if they don't trust you, they're going to walk away. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can be providing more revenue. You can be cleaning the property better. You can be, uh, uh, treating their guests like rock stars. And if they don't trust you, they're not going to stay. And the very first time you make a mistake, they're going to be calling to fire you, not to fix it. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Annie, you just said it's a feeling. And that just immediately reminded me of a conversation that I had with Pilar, who is the director of Costco University when I was down there for a couple of weeks back in December. And she, you know, explained this whole concept to us uh, about how, you know, what, what we're doing. It's, it's not, it's not the what, it's not the how it's, it's the why, but what that why really means is it, it is the feeling that you get when you're, you're helping guests, you're helping owners. But I wanted to use that as a segue, Steve, to ask a little bit more about Costco University. Of course, when I've gotten home, that's the first thing anybody who follows me on social media asks about is tell us about this amazing school you went to and how hard were the tests and what was it like? And is it is it a real university? And, and it's I think it's mystifying to a lot of people that this even exists. But tell us a little bit about the university and its importance and the role it plays for Costco. Yeah, so it, it started off originally, um, you know, Porto Penasco or Rocky Point. By the way, the name Rocky Point and Porto Penasco refers to the same town. It's the town with two names. Yeah, why? very confusing. Oh, there's, a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of, yeah. there's a lot of people in Costco that have two names too. I've learned it gets very yeah. confusing. Yes. <laughs> you, you've, you've gone through an entire cultural experience of everything having two names, right? Right. Yeah. Cas- yeah. Casago, Casago. <laughs> it's at the highest Casago. level. Yeah. <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> it's uh, it, it fits into our our mantra. So, yes. <laughs> Costco University uh, was started because you know in Rocky Point it was a fishing village, and we had uh, homeowners who were buying from the United States who had specific expectations of of communication, of cleaning, of um, you know accounting. And I was working with a, a local labor force who was used to being um, fisher, you know, fishermen. And so the cultural, um, the, the disparity in culture was pretty dramatic. And I was struggling to bridge that gap of expectations. So the idea of taking the time to invest into the people that we choose to live eight hours of our day with was uh, the precipice of why Costco University. Uh, I think you do people a disservice when you sit them down and hand them a job and don't set them up for success, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, in no, in no elite unit was I ever part of in which there wasn't an indoctrination training and uh and um and and build out to what was ex expected from me and how to do my job that i was ever part of so it just fit into this that it's not fair to sit somebody next to somebody who does reservations watch them for two days and tell them good luck it's you're setting them up for failure and that's not fair um so we hired somebody and we started training them where we could give them the time and energy to to bring them in not only from like, hey, how do you use the software? But also like, what's our values? And, you know, what's expected of you? And how are we supposed to treat our homeowners? And how are we supposed to treat our guests? And uh, getting them ready for success. And it worked. Uh, we started to see that we could, if we picked quality people that had the same uh, values, you know, personal values as we did, then the business values we're never in conflict and being able to go from just saying, cause that's what we do to being able to articulate. Here's what we do and why, uh, gave us, gives them all agency to make decisions. Yeah. And then having the, the hard skill sets to be able to like to use the software and have a resource to go back and get more training. And it's a big reason that we were able to, uh, scale. Uh, the business from just like, you know, 50 properties to about 130 where there's sort of a break point. And then, you know, when you get about 250 properties, again, there's another break point where suddenly like what you were doing then, what got you here isn't going to get you there. And, uh, and being able to build through those break points was a Costco university was a big part of it. And as we started to franchise, like, well, we'll just send to Costco university. <laughs> and uh, that was really unfair to Costco university. Uh, because it wasn't <laughs> built for, it wasn't built for uh, business owners. It was, you know, it got up to that point, but it was really built for employees. So Costco University has gone through a huge transformation. It continues to transform itself into um, a real university for business owners and the people who work for those business owners to learn the industry from the ground up understand the immutable principles of vacation rental, which is, you know, trust, transparency, you know, being owner-centric, uh, guest experience, and then uh, taking those and, and uh, doing ongoing support with uh, ongoing training, recertifications, um, you know, our, our yearly convention, they can come back as often as they like to get training. They can send employees down uh, uh, who are new to get more training. Um, equipping the very best people with the right tools and the right knowledge is the formula for success, right? And so Costco University plays a part in uh, giving them the uh, knowledge and training for success in that, you know, then the tools and the right people is, is up to the individual um, uh, business owner. But without that third leg, the, the stool doesn't stand. And uh, it's, it's a differentiator. And, you know, last year, uh, I was shocked because Pilar, who's our dean of the university, uh, who's uh, universally loved, um, she tracks the hours of support. We Last year, we put in 6,600 
and change wow. in hours of support for our franchisees and our partners to uh, to be successful. And I don't know anybody else who's doing that. And uh, there's no extra charge for as much support as you need from tech support with the software to uh, training support on how to, you know, to, uh, to build out your cleaning teams, to you even, you know, uh, to learning management systems remotely where we've hired people like Dirk Johnson to come in and do a complete masterclass uh, that's that, and with videographers of how to clean these properties, how to inspect the properties, how to hold these standards. And um, it's empowering those local heroes, you know, those, those people who are coming in new or have been doing it for a while and they've been isolated to be able to like have resources to fall back onto. Um, it makes us, it, it makes our partners um, best in class. When you take somebody who's local and loves that community and is invested into their business and then gives them a community to support them and the training for their team and, you know, the resources to be able to do the right stuff to, you know, the, to do, to make the right decisions, to uh, support their team. It, it's, uh, it's the formula for success. It makes everybody stronger, right? I mean, it yeah. really makes every part of it stronger. The support is huge. Yeah. It, at, at the end of the day, this is all just people. This is, mm -hmm. this is a very asset light business. Yeah. It's right. all about mm -hmm. your people. And so if you're not going to equip your people with the ability to be successful, you, you're, you're, you're crippling yourself. Mm -hmm. Steve, I wanted to ask, um, and I asked this, my father, and I was told I'm not supposed to say he was a Marine. He's always a Marine, was in the Marines. <laughs> um, and so a lot of his structure for me growing up kind of, I think, evolved from that place in his life. And, and you, you mentioned kind of the indoctrination of things through, through life that every time you were set up in a group, it was, there was an indoctrination, there was a process. And so do you feel like your experience as an army ranger was crucial to how you evolved it, Casago in general, but just the culture that you were able to build and build out for Casago? Yeah. And first of all, thanks to your dad for his service. Simper five, mm -hmm. he's listening. Mm -hmm. he um, oh, he's always, he's our dads, right. our dad, our dad's listen to every episode. If nobody else does, love, our dads do. I love that. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I had leaders uh, like John Spizo and Andy Ulrich and a handful of others uh, that were instrumental in that time of my life. The the thing that uh, was crucial or, or systematic that that struck me was at some point about 180 units. This company really started getting away from me. Um, I was I was I wasn't able to speak into people anymore. And I have a big belief that uh, as a leader, we have to speak into our people. Mm -hmm. um, having good. Uh, uh, Emotional intelligence, so you have empathy, but while also holding them to the standards and being really clear about the standards is uh, important. So when you take emotional intelligence and holding people to the standards, that's the mark of a mature leader. Uh, that that those standards being clear is kindness. Uh, the way that you approach it uh, to not be cruel is the way you you get people to follow you. But um, you take those and being able to speak into, into individuals is how you, uh, you do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But as this company was really getting away from me, it was becoming unwieldy. Uh, things were happening in the, in the company that were not how I envisioned this thing to be. Uh, I started going back to looking at like, you know, Ranger Battalion and wondering like, why does Ranger Battalion work? Or why does a fraternity work? Um, you know, why do these organizations do well? And uh, the founders of Ranger Battalion wrote a credo and they had they had values that they had in mind and they wrote a set of rules that we all had to repeat every single day. And we all understood uh, how to make decisions off of this. And we were held accountable. We had to sign our paper. We actually had to sign paperwork that if we ever broke the Ranger Creed, 
we could be kicked out of Ranger Battalion. You know, some people were. Yeah. Um, the uh, when it comes to making decisions based on those principles, it's why you could take a uh, you could take a small group of Rangers who were uh, out in in a remote area in harsh terrain with hostiles in front of them and an unclear set of directions, just only knowing what their goals and of the mission are and what the principles that they've been, that they've, they've been assigned to uh, and believe in to, to use. And they can accomplish those goals doing the right things without the um, oversight of leadership. And so we, I sat down and I, I wrote out the principles of that espoused our values and they and and I believe that values are immutable. Principles can evolve, and our principles have evolved. We created this thing called the Orange Credo, and it talks about owners, renters. You know, it talks about uh, it talks about nurturing. It talks about uh, guiding each other. It talks about excellence. These uh, these principles are a, a guide so that when your housekeepers out at a home by herself, if she's been having a great uh, uh, leadership group that's working with her and talking about it daily, she can make decisions based on what she knows our values are and these principles are. Or when your maintenance man has to make a decision, he can make it and he can back his decisions based on the principles. That clear that clarity of what the expectations are through these principles is not only kind to them, but it, it gives them the ability to make judgment calls and back it uh, and uh, on your principles. And, you know, it may not always be the best decision, but it'll always be a good decision if they understand the principles that they can operate because they can defend it. And I always tell them like, if you can defend it to the, to the credo, you're never in trouble. If you can look mm -hmm. and say, I, I'm, I went out and I spent this money and did the extra time to take care of this owner because our very first principle is I am the owner's advocate. And I was being the owner's advocate. I'm like, Good enough. Right. Yeah. And so the ability to grow beyond a, a specific leader is it, instilling those principles that honor your values and talking about them daily. That's where you start to turn a herd of cats into a team of horses because they all know what to do and they all can do it on their own. And with a little bit of guidance and given a mission of which direction to head, they'll all decide, they'll all know exactly. Uh, what they need to do and make decisions in your absence. Yeah. It's, so it's amazing. a well, -oiled, it's a well-oiled machine. And, and I say yeah. that not just from the culture standpoint, but you think about it and I hadn't really thought this way until this conversation, but really those values and what you just explained was also part of how you built the software, right. Or the, a lot of the intent behind some of the things that you built in the software for the transparency and just, you know, being the owner's mm -hmm. advocate, making sure that there's there, you know, there's complete um, visibility into what, what goes on and and the ease that it gives to your staff to be able to service the guests and the runners too. But um, talk a little bit about that on the tech, technology side, because that is a really important part uh, to Casa Go and to what we're able to offer franchisees and, and to property owners. Yeah. So, uh, you know, from a technology point of view, uh, I was privileged enough to be part of the journey with Carlos on Streamline. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, the software matters. It is it is a force multiplier in your ability to do a job efficiently and the logistics of what's happening without the human error is greatly mm -hmm. decreased by those by that software. Mm -hmm. um, how you use the software will determine how well you do with it. Um, you know, I've watched people with the exact same operating system. One person says, change my life. And another person says, it's completely useless. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, uh, the technology matters, but the training and use of that technology is the key. Um, we've, we've built out things like, uh, I mean, we've been part of Streamline. Uh, we've built on add-ons like uh, the Casa app, which is really a human resources task management and um, and um, accountability tool, um, which we're actually going through a complete rebuild again because uh, as we've grown, we've, we've outgrown it a little bit and the complexities are getting deeper. 
Uh, we have uh, software like Audiences, which is a homeowner acquisition tool, uh, which is un under constant uh, um, construction and rebuild and, and improvement. Um, you know, just the the tech suite as a whole uh, matters in these days because you can't be competitive without it. But the application of how it's used is the real advantage. Yeah, absolutely. I was telling somebody earlier about the QR code technology that we've developed that we have in the rooms to help guests understand how to use the hot tub or to the Wi-Fi, um, the shower. I mean, literally anything that could cause a guest to have to call you. And we all know in this business that they're going to call <laughs> if they can't figure something out. Um, and the person I was telling about this, you would have thought I said I'd discovered uh, a fire or something. I mean, he was just blown away. But when you think about it, you know, I've talked to some of our locations that they say that that's reduced their phone calls, their service calls by 90%. So it's things like that that I feel like, you know, your experience within the business for so many years that enabled you to really be able to develop these these systems and softwares that that help us be able to run run better and more efficiently. And that's that's the difference. We talk about this a lot on the show with a lot of the newer softwares that are out there that it just doesn't have that 22 years of experience boots on the ground, you know, using the software and being in the business. Yeah. Anticipating yeah. the need before yes. it becomes one. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's actually I, one, I of, one of one of one of the our credo. <laughs> oh yeah, well, yeah, anticipate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know the 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 best values you're going to find is uh, people come up with amazing inventions when they get uh, um, uh, hit around the head and neck enough to finally figure out a solution. Yeah. And sometimes the and sometimes <laughs> the well, listen to those phone calls and you know we have a a woman who's about to become an orange badger, which means she's been with us for ten years in the Scottsdale office, her name is Susanna. And her superpower is patience. And mm. I've, mm. I've, I would sit in my office and listen to Susanna be so kind to, <laughs> who was obviously a very old person on the other line, <laughs> um, try to figure out how to work a remote control for hours and hours. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I, like, I was like, I was, I was like, I was like throwing a rope over a rafter to hang myself listening. To this <laughs> <laughs> that's a visual and, and oh my she God. was like and she's just over like, no no let me show you again and uh, just love her but the amount of hours she was spending and it was was nuts and uh i'd, I'd had a uh experience where i went down to cabo with a headlight uh for my forerunner and uh and you know i'm, I'm a mechanical and my dad was a mechanic i'll i'll take i'll put this new light this new uh, headlight in Two hours later, I've got all the bolts out and I cannot pull the stupid headlight out. I finally watched a YouTube video and there was like this, there was like this bolt where you had to reach underneath the bumper, back up and back around and unscrew it from like where you could never see it. Right. I've been yanking on this bumper. I had the bumper like all warped and distorted because I was <laughs> freaking crowbarring on this thing. And so it literally, as soon as I watched the YouTube video, like within three minutes, I was, I was like, <laughs> yeah. oh my God. And I was like, and I walked back in and Marco, who's in the Cabo office, I hear him on the phone call. He's like, no, no, just turn the heat up. Just the knob on the right. And I'm like, man, we need a YouTube video. For YouTube videos. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. So, wait a, so I'm like, wait a minute. So I, I went and I videoed how to do it. And I went back to the office and like, then I had to like create a QR code I had to print a QR code and I had to make it go to the YouTube video and upload the to YouTube video. Then I had to get it laminated then I have to go back and stick it in there I'm like well this is never going to work this is too much work so <laughs> right. you know the, the system we have now is we, we have these pre-built placards and uh you can make the video right at the house hit upload stick it to the wall and it's done and it's oh, uh nice. yeah yeah 90 percent drop in calls for anything that we put a qr code on and wow really been, yeah. when i was at that. When I was at Casa Go University, I don't remember if I've told you this, Steve, I don't think I've told you any, but one of the days I was out in the field with David, seeing how they um, they actually put these in the units, I, I recorded some of the directions, so how to use the Wi-Fi, how to turn the shower on, how to turn the TV on, and I was so nervous recording these little videos, and David said, he's like, why are you nervous? You do podcasts, and you know, you're on stage and stuff, and I thought, I don't know, I was just like, 
I don't want to mess this up because right. I don't want I don't want the guests to end up calling because they watched the cure go and they were still <laughs> like I don't know what it. she's saying. <laughs> yeah. but she doesn't know what she's doing. Yeah. Oh gosh, but it's that. so funny, and we can track how many times those QR codes have been scanned. Too. Yeah, so, I mean that's really the yeah. cool thing. You know, if it's you useful. Can, yeah, I mean like yeah. it's complete trackability to whether or not it's helping operations. So yeah, it's yeah, cool. it's re- it's really cool. And if that home ends up going out of inventory, the QR code automatically switches over to a. Uh, uh, a video that's a advertisement for um, Casago. So, oh kind of wow, little, I love uh, that. that. Yeah, that's full cool. cool circle. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Steve, fun. where do you um, where do you see? I mean, obviously, you've got Alex now, so you've got a, a superpower to help you kind of catapult to the next level. But where do you see Casago going in five, ten years? I mean, will we ever get the the answer? Is it Casago or Casago? I don't know. But where are you guys going to go in ten years? <laughs> Some, some things are meant to be left unanswered. <laughs> <laughs> it's an enigma. <laughs> Mysterious. <laughs> right. Love uh, it. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll put the correct pronunciation on the back of my headstone. <laughs> oh, oh my god! I don't want to wait that long. I don't. I really. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, are closer in age. I don't know. Uh, it's going to be a race. Did, <laughs> did you Did you ever hear about that woman who uh, said that she would never give up her oatmeal? The only time she'd ever give up her oatmeal cookie recipe was over a dead body. And she oh, had the uh, she had the recipe put on the back of her headstone. It was oh, really pretty oh funny. My gosh, I wow. love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. I would have put it in my my uh, uh, your obituary, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think it's I think it's a great way to to uh, get people to come visit your headstone. I guess, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's it's, true. It, uh, it's pretty funny. Anyways, uh, so you know, in the we're 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 going to continue to grow. We've got uh, a goal of a uh, pretty aggressive goal for this year. Yeah. Um, I would tell you this, that if you look at the top 10 residential uh, real estate companies in the world, they're all franchises. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why. Uh, It's still a local business, like we keep going back to. Uh, Those local realtors uh, know know their area, know their city, love their city. They're, They're beholden and accountable to their areas. Uh, but they needed tech and they needed distribution and they wanted a recognizable name. And they, uh, and that's why you, when we see a red, white, and balloon, we all know Remax. Um, it's sustainable and it's generational. And uh, I believe that vacation rentals is still a very personal and very local business. Mm-hmm. And being able to empower these local heroes uh, with better tools every year uh, and a ton of value for them is the model that gets us to a uh, consumer facing brand. Mm-hmm. So, you know, our goal is to not just grow bigger, but to grow better and recognizable. And the number one job we have through a series of different strategies is to be the most um, valuable resource that local property managers under the Costco umbrella could ever, ever have. Mm-hmm. If we continue to do that, growth and uh, brand name recognition will take care of itself, mm-hmm. along, with, uh, along with Alex's help. On, on <laughs> <laughs> whatever to do no, no, no. list is long. So. <laughs> but, but uh, the, the more the more love letters we send out to homeowners, yeah, and the more love letters we get back, uh, the better the company gets. Yeah, absolutely. and your blinds <laughs> just magically drop down. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, oh, cinem- cinematic effect. Really, <laughs> if anybody's not watching on YouTube, and it should be. <laughs> yeah, like, and he's gone. <laughs> Terry White will love that. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Steve, thank you so much for coming yeah. on the show, and just I, you oh, know, my pleasure. I, it, this is this is exciting. We've obviously Annie's wanted to have you on the show for a year and a half since we started Huge the podcast. Fan. <laughs> I've wanted to have you have you on the show since I first met Ryan about a, a year ago now. But um, it's it's been such an amazing journey, and I'm sure everyone who's who's seen my social media knows that I'm a little bit uh, obsessed with <laughs> the company and where we're going, mm-hmm. and and just in love in love with it. And I think 
when you have employees that become part of that employer brand and and just that love the mission, that's where the secret sauce is. And um, yeah. just it's been great getting to know everybody and and learn what this culture really is all about. But if anybody wants to contact you, uh, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Uh, you can always email me at steve at casago.com. S S T E V E at C S A G O dot com. Or um, if you're looking to learn more about franchising, uh, Alex, A L E X at Costco dot com. <laughs> this, this, this is the first, first time that I've given somebody's contact info that I was before I asked you said, I could just say contact Steve because right? I know it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, Steve, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate yeah. you guys. If, Can't wait if to anybody see wants year. Yes. If anybody wants to get in touch with Annie now, you can go to alexandannypodcast.com. If you're enjoying the show, we'd love to hear from you. If you could leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcast. And until next time, thank you for tuning in.